Um, this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, October 13th, Thursday the 13th, just almost Friday the 13th, but not quite. Um, not that I'm superstitious or anything. <laughs> but um, Europe is different. Like, what's up with that? Who made Europe so different? I mean, we do call it the old world. Hi, Stacy. Hello. Welcome um, back. Thank you very much. Um, it was Bulgaria. funky to be away. From, pardon? You were in Bulgaria, is that right? Or no, I was in Romania, Romania right, right next door. Okay. I was in Romania for the first week and then Lithuania for the next week. I didn't hit all the other Anias, but I was tempted. Uh, but there's a lot. Uh, uh, between the Anias and the Ovas, there's like a lot. And, the, and never mind the stands. Uh, there's well, you a hit whole, both the Balkans and the Baltic. That's but true. Those, those are also very different from one another. Running through the bees. And I was surprised how far it was to get from Romania up to Lithuania. Like, like I had to do three hops. I had to travel most of a day uh, to get from uh, Bucharest to uh, Kaunas. <clears throat> and uh, Kaunas is, is the second largest city in Lithuania. So I landed in Vilnius and my host picked me up and we drove the hour back to Kaunas kind of thing. Um, but it was really interesting to be among humans because the first event I went to was Unfinished 22 in Bucharest. Um, th this is a 10-year-old conference that um, used to occupy a national museum and somehow they convinced the museum to let them come in and take over and they used to just like run, run crazy in the museum and do all kinds of cool stuff. And I never attended that in person. They asked me to speak virtually two years ago for 2020. And I loved that. And I did a, I recorded a, a video talk, which they then presented, blah, blah, blah. And then this year they were like, hey, we're back live, but we're not at the old venue. We're at a new venue. And they basically took over the grounds of a building and some other interesting objects uh, uh, that belong to the University of Bucharest. And it, there was sort of a white, a really nice old white building that they repurposed each room. One room was a tea room. One room was actually in the back was a, a little auditorium. So they, they, they made like yoga and panels back there. And then uh, in the middle was a, almost a church-like nave with a, with a stained glass back. And they put a baby grand in front of that. And they had uh, Dan Jones, who's the, the founder of the Modern Love column in the New York Times. He was there all week. And... Um, uh, he would choose from among the stories uh, in the modern love column and have a man and a woman read those in front of the baby grand with a bunch of people just sitting on the ground crowded around. That was like the, the first evening. Um, and then he would also ask for volunteers to come up and sort of do some interaction uh, around love stories and all that kind of stuff it was really, really cool. But the first people I meet at Unfinished are three Brazilians, one of whom goes by Macul. And he winds up being our itinerant guitar singing host who tours us walking through the grounds because in the middle of these grounds is a little kind of a forest, which apparently was just a thicket of, of cruft beforehand. And they cleaned it up and they put fire pits and chairs and little orbs. So at night, the whole forest kind of glowed warmly and it was delightful. And then there was a greenhouse in the back, which as I show up, a couple of days before the event starts, they're busy still repairing glass panels in, in the greenhouse. And then that turns into a beautiful venue and so on and so forth. And they had an outdoor stage. And then the next two uh, Brazilians, the next two people I meet are, are a young duo, uh, a brother and sister duo who are singers, songwriters, rappers, Instagram stars, TikTok stars, who manage modern media better than anybody I've seen ever, like met in person. And he has a really sharp stutter. He's a rapper. And when he's rapping, it's smooth as butter and really fast and really beautiful. And when you talk with him, he's delightful and sincere and has a very sharp stutter. And that was like my intro to the whole thing. Um, and then all these people started saying, this brain thing you're doing is amazing. And I opened my laptop and looked like a geek next to these extremely cool people dressed in extremely cool clothes. Um, and so that was kind of cool. And then I did office hours for two hours each day with my brain, uh, something I, I suggested to the organizers and they were like, sounds great. So they just put me in a room with a flat panel and some chairs. Uh, and we ended up having people sitting on the ground and asking great questions. And that was just like completely awesome. So, so Unfinished was, was way wicked cool. And then I went from there to Lithuania to a completely different event that was more like attending a UNESCO meeting. Um, and uh, that was fun, fun as well. And getting to know Lithuania was really cool. Um, but, uh, uh, and the talks I did were both originals 
and fit together in an interesting way. And the first one was recorded and will be posted online. And I can't wait for that. The second one wasn't recorded at all. Um, and so I kind of want to expand it and re-record it. Um, because on the second one, I just made a bunch of assertions. I said that my first couple slides were, here's the TLDR of, of what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to give you the whole speech now, just speaking through the assertions. Then I'm going to go back to the first one and then build the argument and show like why I, why I think this. And I've got I can um, I can get links to the to the uh, slide decks in Google Slides and share those into the into the conversation. Anyway, that's kind of that's kind of my check in, um, and it's really nice to be back and uh, sort of strange to be back uh, because when you travel, like home looks different. Um, and you that realize really what I was alluding to with my question. Like, yeah. Yeah. It changed it changes home a bit, right? And it changes how you treat home or how you think of home or where you what you want to do with home or or all those kinds of things. And I met some extraordinary people. Um <clears throat> there was one guy at the end. Um so let me just uh unfinished 22 off center so i'm going to connect that and there was one performer um named jurgis who i um, got to talk to a bit just one-on-one -on -one. and uh i'll show you what he does here's him just solo um i'll put a uh, this link in our chat um here's him just solo um he wields a drum machine with his foot and a guitar and has a little madonna mic on and he can he can make a crowd into a beautiful circle of love like like he was just this master of getting everybody's like singing and jumping in and moving around him and coming in closer and then going back and then whatever and i'm like I hope we're post pandemic, damn it, because everybody's up really close and personal, but, um, but it was beautiful. Um, and he's just so confident and powerful doing the thing he does. And uh, he was sort of one of the, the, the performers um, who were like that. Yeah, apparently when stutterers sing, they can, the stutter can go away. It's really, really interesting. Super interesting. Um, anyway, uh, any Thoughts, questions, uh, other things about about the trip? I, um, I'll just unsolicitedly, um, the talk I gave this year, um, what I did was, I, I really liked the keynote I did two years ago, which is called uh, the, uh, Trust is the Only Way Forward. So this year's theme was off center. And so what I did for this year's talk was I said, I want to tell you how I got the backstory, how I got the thesis for my 2020 talk. So at the top of my talk, I did a, here's a two minute summary of what I said in 2020. I got there because I discovered I had all these contrarian heroes who were off center. And so I told the story of five of my contrarian heroes and then went into the rest of it and sort of dug in how I got to design from trust, how I got to, to realize that we stopped trusting people. I, I told that whole story. And it was really nice to sort of tell the backstory in some semi-official format, uh, because it's really important to the formulation of everything I, I believe in. And the, the theme and format of the event made really nice room for that. Um, and I, I'll ask someone to check in. And in the, in the meantime, I'll go find the uh, Google Docs slides for um, the two decks, the two, uh, the two decks that I, that I created. Um, in fact, um, they're on my now page right now. So if you go to, um, if you go here, I built a, a wiki page for the trip where I put, um, I, I'm certainly, I put the unfinished slide deck there. I'm not sure I put the other slide deck there. I should do that. I should add that. But if you follow that trail, you can, you can locate the deck. Um, so why don't we go, um, Doug, there being only one Doug on the call at this moment, which is unusual. <laughs> Um, why don't we go, um, Doug, Grace, Klaus. I can do that. Um, well, the thing I wanted to bring back in actually had to do with picking up a thread from the previous session. 
Um, and I was describing um, having separated contributing, serving, providing value in other con in some context or other to others um, from meeting needs and dropping the transactional frame around that that is sort of the the rule of the land. And um, when when the when meeting my needs is shifted, into a unitary thing, not as part of a transactional frame. It opens up all sorts of interesting facets and dimensions um, that has to do with not just needs, but receiving and the distinction definition, the difference between what's a need and a want, which sort of speaks to the heart of um, there's enough for everybody. Why do we have all these pockets and populations subject to scarcity? Um, and um, clearly folks that have well transcended needs are gonna need to give up some for folks that are on the needs not met list uh, to sort of catch up. And um, and a couple of people sort of went to the the needs receiving in on the needs side and invoking the sort of uh, philanthropy label and association. And the I'm bl I don't know why I'm blanking on the underlying word for what drives a philanthropic thing. Um, anyone that wants to help can. Are you talking um, about when the word agenda came up? No, not agenda. Um, Altruism, it, was it? Well, yes, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, and actually, you were the one that popped to mind when I when I sort of hit on why is in this frame it not about altruism? that um, altruism carries in it a whole bunch of cultural stuff that's rooted in a separation and othering between those that are altruistic and implicitly can afford to be and those who are receiving the benefit of that altruism and a whole bunch of connotative stuff about um, their station in life, their circumstance, the reason they have need that is met, being met by the altruist. So uh, reason for being able to be altruistic kind of sticks out for me because uh, I've been in situations where extremely poor people do extremely altruistic things who you would think have no, no resources or capacity and yet, the, the most generous people I've met are extremely poor. And, and, also, and also they give more of their own worth in so doing than wealthy people do. Yeah, and, and the, what, I'm, what I'm sort of calling into question is calling that altruism. So are, are you trying to examine altruism and say, is that the right word? Is that the right Correct. Word? Okay. Yeah, and, and, and the whole cultural package around that being the name for somebody who responds to a need they see um because if we're all connected and we're all you know part of the same pond same source same everything that's not um it's what you do it's not it's not altru it's it's not uh it's without veneer and and um, so that was really it was living for me because I've had people invoke the altruistic meme and the philanthropic meme in response, and not I haven't had why those aren't it. 
in in my orientation of frame and frame around um, needs, meeting somebody's needs or being on the receiving end of somebody meeting your needs. That it's it's um, the other side of that. Um, if if disconnected from uh, quid pro quo, if disconnected from uh, uh, receiving in exchange for, is simply that person's way of serving, contributing. Period. And it's not transactional. And it's not, you know, like really trying to blank sheet paper and shed all of the current prevailing orientations and embedded associations. Um, and so I just, I wanted to share that because it was, a, um, I could, you know, I felt like I could finally explain the difference, <laughs> the distinction, um, which isn't easy to get to uh, unless you sort of, cut bait from the transactional stuff and look at needs as in relation to, you know, as a standalone. Um, and, and what's the new way of relating to um, needs and the meeting thereof. So that's, Thanks. that's, that's for me. Thanks. Doug, from, from all of that, Mark, could you, Mark, could um, you summarize? Oh, okay. So, uh, Mark, uh, Klaus had raised his hand earlier, but uh, that's a good question just before Klaus. So do you want to do a TLDR yourself, Doug? I'm sorry. What, what was the ask? Could you summarize? Um, so re, re, uh, reorienting and recontextualizing the um, needs as a um, as an energetic center of gravity in reality and in the universe um, is sort of foundational to or informs how we solve the challenges we're trying to meet by like taking it out of the frame of judgment or the frame of um, all the loaded stuff of getting something for nothing, right? Like all, there's a whole bunch of stuff that could be unpacked and, and identify it as not invited to the party going forward if we're gonna relate differently and newly to solving the inequities and imbalances. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I think the term we, we used was reciprocal altruism. The reciprocity in altruism basically is a survival tool because, um, and, and just going back to the dawn of everything, you know, that people have to be able to trust each other, to trust one another, um, and that helping someone in need is just a reflex within a group. <clears throat> and if we could expand that reflex to also function between groups, then that would be you know, a very helpful uh, way of going forward. But it's this idea of almost a radical you know, the, the reciprocal altruism uh, in order to, to uh, solve issues that, that are, that are uh, uh, meeting our collective. Right? Anyone else um, feel strongly about this? And, and so, Doug, I'm aware of two things as you're talking. One is that you are expressing that there's some freight or baggage associated with altruism that has to do with mental accounting or bookkeeping, uh, and that that gets in the way of policy questions where conservatives are like, why should I pay taxes for someone else to get something that I, I didn't fucking cause? And why am I paying taxes anyway? And so you didn't make those explicit, but I'm just trying to bring those yeah. into the conversation because I think that's why you're asking the question is like, we're, we're trying to figure out which words are better to describe that dynamic so that maybe people can have their needs fulfilled without there being this bookkeeping and this sense of guilt or debt or obligation or any other sort of thing. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Witzel, please jump in. Hey, yeah, so, I, so many different things popped up, Doug, but uh, you, you were pushing a few buttons. I, I wanted to point out the uh, link to uh, Atlas Hugged, which is- Which I've book. never <laughs> heard of. Which I, just, I just followed it now and I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. I mean, it's really pretty awful, but is it? it's kind of a hoot. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's awful. Fiction. It's oh, awful. Hey, so it's, really sucks. <laughs> it's a horrible book. But but it's it's got a few like really interesting ideas and right I mean one Doug is that idea that if you're if you go from if your framework is the humanity as an organism versus you, individuals as the entity of decision making then it no longer is altruism when you're helping the organism right you get rid of the concept of altruism because it's all internalized and I think that's the problem I've had is like you know I keep saying why why don't we optimize for so social value right that's clearly what we ought to be doing is optimizing for social value, but that's just not built into any of our, our economics. And then, um, and then the other piece I just wanted to stick in because I thought it was really interesting and I, I've kind of Googled around and haven't found a lot about it, but he talks to the very end of the book, I don't know if you noticed that he talks about adaptive fictions and like that we have, he argues that we have these fictions in society that are actually evolutionarily adaptive. They're helpful fictions. We lie to ourselves, but it's useful. And, uh, you know, I think religion probably falls into that category in some ways. He was say, he was using the example of um, when you take the oath, you know, I swear on the I swear on my God that I will tell the truth. It's like, well, the God's a fiction, but truth is a real thing kind of, you know. Um, so we, we, we do these. Kind of, and I was and I've been wondering about solar punk as like a fiction that would drive our adaptation in a you know, coherent way. So but I, I just I have not seen a lot of literature about this adaptive fiction thing. So. You know, it's it's not, I think, as, as much out there as I, I kind of expected it to be. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, Mark. Hi, um, and uh, lower hand. Um, well, th thanks, Doug. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, Mrs. Hickey um, lives next door, an older woman. And uh, yesterday she was trying to back out and there was a big construction truck um, keeping her from uh, uh, seeing the traffic uh, when she backs out of her garage. So I um, walked out of the street and uh, looked both ways and put a thumbs up. She saw the thumbs up. She backed out safely and, and kept on going. Um, and it brought to mind, you know, the Jane Jacobs book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And basically the nature of formal and informal relationships. So if you live in a big city and, you know, at the bottom of your uh, brownstone is a grocer and the grocer sees your kid all the time, the grocer is going to like watch over the kid because he's familiar with the kid. The kid knows him. If he, you know, runs into the street, the grocer is going to like, you know, see something, step out in front of a car and say, you know, look out. Um, it's the, it's just natural human nature to, you know, have relationships where, you know, these things form without mm -hmm. words, without, without a kind of conscious, um, it's an involuntary process where we care for each other. And trying to put a label on it strikes me as weird. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, love kind of this conceptual exploration, but I must say I'm lost and I'd, I'd love Doug for you to come up with a one sentence kind of, you know, what do they call it? Um, when you're in an elevator and you're giving a pitch, like elevator pitch. Elevator, it's called elevator pitch, yeah. That's a, yeah, a um, strange, strangely appropriate thing. Wondering, you know, what, what that is, um, I, I must say I'm still lost, but thank you. Uh, I, I, I cherish the exploration so and it looks like my internet's gone. Your internet is flicking a bit. If I can throw in one thing that might be relevant, Doug, tell me if I'm sort of zeroing in closer, then I'll go right back to the queue. Um, Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, um, talks about gifts. And part of what I remember from The Gift was that for some people, gifts involve mental accounting, where I gave something to you, so so you owe me something of equal value back, kind of. And we, we're like, you know, how much was it worth, and 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 so on and so forth. 
Um, and he says that in traditional societies, very often gifts are meant to circulate. They go through the society and the gifts are sort of boundary objects that where stories are told around the gifts. And he talks about the Kula rings in the South Pacific among islanders who travel great deal, you know, great distances over open ocean to go visit and then exchange uh, bracelets for the men and necklaces for the women or something like that. Uh, and then tell the story of what happened while I had this object in, in the culture. And when Native Americans gave objects to the settlers, they expected those objects to come back with stories. Uh, and instead, those objects went into museums and, you know, for Queen Victoria or Elizabeth or whoever, uh, I guess Elizabeth, um, and were never seen again. And, and so there was this break of, of how gifts were even seen and the valuation of these objects and all of that language and, and set of assumptions. And I think, Doug, you're trying to question those assumptions, which I like a lot. And the more we start to mechanize and measure and valorize those exchanges and make them more explicit, the more we fuck up the natural um, sort of exchange of need and care that exists in a good community, which is hopefully done more or less effortlessly. Although sometimes it takes, it's very effortful. Sometimes it takes a lot of work to, to fix what's, what's broken for somebody. Uh, but is the gift, a, 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 does that build your argument sort of? Yeah, it's 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 part and parcel. Same same sort of trying to get out from under the carry and the programming and imprint of these things. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, Grace, then John, then Gil. So this obviously touches on the work that I'm doing with Priceless, which is much more about meeting needs and about recording not so much what was given and how it was given but you know knowing who has a physical need like whose plate is empty and how far the food travels that's sort of the minimum viable thing and then the thing that you, i think is necessary for scaling is something like knowing who and that could be by community or by individual or whatever who basically is decent like, who can you trust for what? Like, you can trust these people to be generous with their food. You can be trust these people to give good advice. And you can trust those people to show up, but they don't have much to share, but they'll show up and help out. And so that kind of sense of, is that, it's like a reputation for being a decent human being. It's not a reputation necessarily for how much you can give. It's just like, okay, this guy shows up. He's, you know, he's got a bad back and he just kind of sits and watches the kids and tells stories he's giving the best he can. And so his reputation is great. You know, and, and you can call him to when you're chopping wood, he won't chop any wood, but he'll read stories to the children. And so that kind of understanding of fairness is really what's needed to scale. And what I talk a lot about is why are we measuring proxy? Money's just a proxy, right? So that's in that. Um, I wanted to relate to what Jerry said about like without guilt and without a feeling of needing to, you know, a feeling of obligation, but I think it's just the opposite. And um, Charles Einstein writes about that in his book, Sacred Economics. Like the idea is that you will feel a sense of obligation, that you will feel that you should pay it forward or do your best or give it back if you have a chance or pass it around in the case, you know, and tell your story in the case of what Jerry told. There is a sense of obligation. It's not guilt, but it's a sense of obligation. And that sense of obligation is what binds us to other people. You know, I come to this thing and, you know, there's an obligation to share of my knowledge. It's just, you know, if somebody came here and never participated, it would be weird. There should be a sense of obligation. So that's the other one. And then the other one about adaptive fiction, I wanted to mention to David that, um, Actually, Brett Weinstein talks about this, about he says that things that are factually incorrect, but um, figuratively correct. And he talks about them as religions and traditions. And, and he, he tells this story about how he was in Jamaica or something, and he used to pass by these kids who, were, who, who would play together. And one day he got the hiccups and they're like, okay, well, what you do is you like, you like, Get, you know, you, you go <clears throat> and you just like spit a huge gob into your hand and then you put it on your head like that and then your hiccups go away. And he's been talking to them for a while, so he does it. And sure enough, his hiccups go away. He's like, 
I don't know if they were just playing with me because it's clearly that choking up all that stuff is what did it, not the sticking it on your head, or whether that's really a myth that goes around, you know, like part of, and part of the myth is true, and part of the myth is, and so it's sort of figuratively true. If you act as if it were true, if you behave as if it were true, then you have a higher sense of survival, uh, a way of, you know, a higher, higher level of survival, and you kosher rules are like that too. Like apparently that works. So yeah, that's me. That's my response to that conversation. Thanks, Grace. If you have any links to this notion of things that are factually not necessarily functional or accurate, but 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 work, I, I would love that because I was just sort of googling around a little bit. Um, would love something to point to a little bit more. But thank you, um, John. Then Gil. Okay. Uh, wow. <clears throat> a lot of really good, interesting stuff coming in here. Just our second check-in too. Yeah, right. Um, I, I I really like that notion of it's not transactional in, in the accounting sense, but it is accumulative in that sense of, well, who's who's really good for what, <laughs> you know, in, in the community exchange. The, also, a little footnote, I believe the subtitle of the gift is the erotic life of property. And if that my memory in Jerry's nodding his head. So yes. And that ought to be a clue right there that, you know, think about how, how much trouble we have managing uh, eroticism and transfer that to the, you know, some of the complexity of our exchanges. Uh, I mean, I, that's a maybe a pessimistic thought, but, you know, it's there. Um, to, I, I've seen some documentaries of people, Westerners, Westerners who had sort of rigid religious points of view and maybe had money or didn't have money. And they went and they started hanging out in, in underdeveloped communities. And they basically got their minds blown, you know, and, and they, and you, then you see them talking and they're talking about, well, how we do this now? What, what are we, how are we you know, and you realize they've gone completely post-transactional. You, you realize, you know, it's like, it just comes across like, whoa, wow, you know, and I've had a little bit of that, you know, if you, if you, if you go to an event that is multi-day and it has some kind of ritual containment, um, that happens to you, you know, you get, you, you say, wow, you know, my mind, I mean, I haven't been to Burning Man, but I hear that the whole thing about the no, no buying and selling, you know, is a big part of, of what happens. Uh, I've been in other events like that where something like that happens. Um, on the other side, or as a, as a constraint to thinking about this kind of transition, um, it, it, it would be a good thing. I mean, I would recommend anybody who we could get, who we could talk into having one of those experiences would have a nice footnote, at least in their, in their material life, about, wow, you know, I spent some time and I was post-material, post-transactional, whatever, you know, and, and it felt kind of good. But the, the fear that you encounter among even uh, generous people, I mean, we have a, in our neighborhood, we have, like we have an, a homeless person who we've adopted, who we, you know, give stuff to, and he's there all the time. And, you know, he's got a, he's got a station, he's got a little thing, and he knits, and he's in a wheelchair. And, you know, we gave him a, we gave him actually a like a like a wheelchair, like a walker, and a bunch of other things. But th there's this containment aspect. There's this idea that it's not unlimited. I'm not going to be in this situation where it's just me or a few of us and a whole bunch of them show up, and it we're just overwhelmed, you know. And I sense that that fear, that whole build a border wall thing is way out of proportion in the United States, way, way out of proportion. And there's also a lot of reverse jokes you could tell about how Mexicans actually work harder than, than uh, Anglos, uh, and they're true. But putting that aside, you know, we, we, there is something to the, to the idea that if we could somehow hit, like if we had a, a quasi-Scandinavian social net, and I hear it's breaking down, but you know, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. If we had a quasi Scandinavian social net, so I know, yes, there are definite needs. And yes, some of those needs are deep, emotional, spiritual. And I'm, I might be called upon 
to support someone in that way, but it's not unlimited and they're not going to starve, you know? That would change a lot. I think that would, I think there's a lot of people who are, you know, I'm, I'm really bothered by homelessness. I'm really troubled. I'd like to help. And I feel overwhelmed because there's so many, there's so many tents, there's so many things. And it just, I'm, I don't see the end of it, you know? So something to think about, uh, something to work into our design uh, conclusions. Okay. Thanks, John. And some of our conversations have been around a link I put in the chat a little earlier, which is what platforms might we use in OGM and Meta Project and everything else to track flows of value? And I, I, you know that that's an open question for us. Like, what does what does our platform look like going forward? And Grace is kind of working on that as well. Um, so there's practical software implications for some of this stuff as well. Mr. Friend, Mr. Mikulski, welcome back. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so this is a very rich conversation for me, and I'm really grateful to all of you um, for stirring up a lot of stuff in me. So thank you for that. Um, um, John, the erotic life of property uh, provokes me, but I'm not sure if I like it or don't. <laughs> so we'll see, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, let, me, let me weave back through a couple of things here. Uh, I'll start at the end. John, you talked about maybe the Scandinavian, is John still here? You uh, John just took a phone call, so he I saw him pick up his uh, smart device and oh, yeah. have to wander off. I wasn't smart enough to see that. Um, the maybe the Scandinavian network social network is breaking down, but we're living in a world where the world is breaking down. Um, you know, story yesterday: sixty nine percent of animals gone in the last like fifty years. Something like eighty percent of insect life gone in the last fifty years. We're at the tail end of a 500 year interval in 50 some odd thousand years of history of human history, where we were ex extracting this shit out of living systems. And so lots and lots of breakdown and, and having a conversation inside of that is a kind of distorted conversation about what is human and what is human potential in human nature. Um, Doug, my TLDR on your TLDR about altruism is that it's about transactions. We, we, are, we are trapped in this story of everything being transaction. And because we live in the capitalist matrix, we look at everything, including the living world, as though it's transactional. Look, you could say that a rose is gorgeous uh, for transactional reasons because it attracts pollinators. But you know, when when gazelles are grazing the Serengeti and 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 impacting soil structure by their hooves through no intention at all, is that transactional or is that just the workings of the system that has evolved to mutual interdependence and benefit? Um, <clears throat> I'm struck by um, reminded. Uh, when we talk about altruism, Doris Lessing's concept of the substance of we feeling, which pervades the Shikasta trilogy, which you have, if you haven't read, go back and dig that out. It's a phenomenal piece of speculative fiction. But the substance of we feeling is, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to feel, Grace, you talked about the obligation in a group. I, I don't feel an obligation in this group, and I welcome people who have come here week after week and never say a word. I don't have any any sense that they're obligated to open their mouths at all because they go and do live their lives in whatever ways they do. But for me, richer than a notion of obligation is a notion of belonging. And I've been living a lot lately in the question of what might it be like if we acted as though we actually belonged to the living world and belonged to each other. Not took care of it, but belonged to it. What happens then? Um, and I note, um, you know, the, the, the passing this week of Bruno Latour, who uh, who waxed eloquently and profoundly and provocatively about this stuff. Of you know, what if what what would it what, what would it be like if we landed on Earth and were Terrans among all the other terrestrials? How would we be? What would we do? Uh, also notable this week, the MacArthur Fellowships were announced yesterday, uh, and Robin Wall Kimmerer. Astoundingly, was one of the recipients. Robin is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Many of you know she's a, um, a a botanist at the State University of New York and an elder in the Potawatomi tribe in the Onondaga region of the northeast of, of, of Turtle Island. 
and is a profound and eloquent and insightful um, story carrier uh, for this perspective. Um, and so to, you know, to the notion of adaptive fiction, David, thank you for that. I'm, I'm thinking of adaptive systems and adaptive fiction is part of that. And it's not a matter of, you know, of whether stories are true or not. Some things are true, even if they're not true, you know, and some things are not true, even if they're true. And we, as human beings, we are stories all the way down. It's what we are, what we do. We are in stories and interpretations all the time. And maybe we have some little bit of choice in which stories we choose to inhabit and which stories we choose to share and how we do that and how we weave this substance that we feeling through story. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Um, I wanted to follow in some of what you were saying and goes back to my quest and my whole thing with the word consumer 30 years ago. And one of the things I realized is that consumerization of our lives involves a series of separations. Uh, we, we become separated from nature. Uh, we become individualistic to express our individualism by buying Nike instead of Puma or Adidas, et cetera, et cetera, Ford versus Mercedes. Um, we're separated from each other, we're separated from meaning and purpose, we're separated from uh, actual construction of things, from the making of the things, because we're just supposed to buy them. And if we stop buying them, everything falls apart. And a piece of the solution to consumerism, consumerism and consumerization, which are different but related things for me, is to reperceive our interdependence, to come back into being parts of nature that were, that that can actually work harmoniously. And we've managed to obliterate uh, all the thinking systems, or at least obscure and squish and push underground, all the thinking systems that say that, that say, hey, actually, um, here are the instructions for living in community on the commons. And if you do this, if you do these kinds of things, it all works out pretty well. <clears throat> and, and, and Gil, my fear is that we are prisoners of a series of stories and narratives that are bullshit narratives. This is partly what my talk, uh, in, in Kaunas, in Lithuania, was exactly about. I talked about how we're in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads uh, and how that's a real problem because many of these narratives were intentionally constructed to create power structures for decades, if not centuries. Yep. And they're very resistant to change. They yep. do not like being tipped or tilted. And once they get power, they're very good. They're very effective at wiping out, uh, you know, uh, people who disagree. And one of the reasons I prize my contrarians is that many of them were saying things that were very heretical within their fields and got ostracized or pushed aside in their fields because they were, they were sort of providing this, this like pin toward the bubble of, of poorly held belief systems in their disciplines. And that my overgeneralization of their beliefs is that, hey, in my discipline, I realized one day that we lost faith in humans. And so we designed a bunch of institutions and norms and systems that are coercive and that force us to do certain things. When in fact, if you start to design from trust, the opposite happens and you get abundance and you get reconnection and community and you get cheaper solutions to the hard problems and you get all these other kinds of things. Yep. So sorry. So this conversation feels very central, sort of in, in, entangled in uh, my own belief systems yep. over, yep. over time. Yeah, a couple more things on that. The, yeah. um, the the bullshit stories, yes, are intentionally propagated to support power. They also emerge, quote, naturally out of power structures. Uh, so there's both an intentional and an unintentional component to them. We're, 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 lock, we're in a battle for the story of the world. That's sort of, the, for me, the larger frame of this whole conversation. Uh, you know, it's a struggle of which story dominates when. Uh, it's, it might be a good time to go back and reread some Marx or even, even more importantly, reread re re some Frederick Engels, who wrote with some eloquence about this stuff and about the relationship of humans and nature uh, and the process of the commoditization and therefore marketization and transactionalization of everything. It's uh, also commodification. Yes, yes, and yes. Commodification and commoditization are related but different. Commodification is when you take something that didn't used to have a price on it. Absolutely. And you and you make sure every piece of it has a price and people have to pay for this thing that was yep. seen as free before. Yep. And commoditization is when you make a whole bunch of them really cheaply. Thank you. So we're talking about, yeah, commodification. Thank you for the correction there. Um, one of the things that um, 
one of the many things that struck me out of the dawn of everything, but one that really resonates and lives with me was is when uh, is, is someone quoting Kandian Rock, the the um, the philosopher statesman of the um, what's the name of the tribe he was from? I forget. Kandian Rock. Uh, that was the guy. Had Nosani. Had Nosani. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and look. He's talking with the Jesuits in, in America about life in Europe, and he's just absolutely astonished. And this is true of, of, of folks who went to Europe and came back, just absolutely astonished that you have people lying in the streets starving. And he says, because here we would just feed them. And it wasn't altruism. It was just what you did. So something about that, about what you did, it's not like who you, I mean, yes, Grace, in the modern world with, with, with very distant relationships, I have to figure out who I can trust. But if I'm in a, in a tribe living with the same hundred people forever, you know, that gets sorted out pretty much. So, um, um, yeah, so anyway, very rich territory for me, as you can tell. Um, uh, the, the last thing I want to say is that I'm, you talked, Jerry, about the challenge of tracking flows of value in this network. I'm very concerned about tracking flows of value. Right. I, think, I think that might be a fundamentally wrong-headed and dangerous approach for us to focus on. And I understand why we do in the world we're in, because we all have to eat. Uh, and I understand the notion of limits. You know, if, 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 if we're all of us in a lifeboat sailing in the sea, drifting in the sea and we come across somebody clinging to an oar, we'll bring her aboard and we'll bring the second one aboard. But at some point we have to say, golly, no, sorry, we can't because all of us will go down. And that's a tough one. And it's full of interpretation, Klaus, your point about the, well, whoever said about the border wall, it was, there's different stories about capacity because we're all living in a very abstracted situation, not the concrete, you know, life and death right in front of your eyes for most of us, fortunately. Thank you for letting me read. Mark. Thanks. Um, I have a, I guess, perennial contribution. Um, basically, looking at the, um, not the allegory, but the um, anal analogy between capitalism as a cost of everything and the price of nothing or was yeah but ba but basically this framing system that distorts um the reality of human life and analogizing that with the notion of narrative the notion of stories where if we take stories as something that overwhelms what um, Jerry said, um, which was institutions, norms, and systems, that stories are very valuable to you know, maintaining these institution norms and systems, but they're not at the center. And looking at life and looking at the self as a narrative is a false model. And I really have to, you know, repeat and, and point this out when it when it comes up as such a strong mm, attractor that we neglect things like I talk truth. Now I don't have to be in a story to talk truth. I just talk truth. It's not based on a story. It's not in service of a story. It's simply a norm or a ethic or a you know, learning that when I tell lies, I'm lying to myself. And this is harmful. It's not a story. It's a reality. Um, I'm going to get off that soapbox, but um, I will continue to attempt to make that point clearly um, because it worries me and I you know in my studies of semiotics um, there are many relations of meaning and communication that are pre-human at the you know how animals communicate they don't communicate with stories not at all um, 
and that yet they do. Um, there yeah, is that so waggle crazy. dance, huh? There is that waggle dance. There is that waggle dance. Is that over a there? Is yeah. a fruit tree in bloom? That's that is a um, indexical reference. Yeah. Rather, I'm just, than, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Uh, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> You know, wiggle your butt. That's all I gotta say. Move your I ass, want, and your mind will follow. Um, Gil, can you hold off for a second? Um, I, I want to go. Can I just say one. Can I just say that one man's indexical reference to another man's story. There we go. Um, I, let me. I let must me. protest against that because of research, where you know, there's. A story is made up of many different things. And I don't think you can, how do you say, devolve a story into a finger where, you know, don't look at my finger, look where it points. That's not a story. So this is a philosophical can of worms we can open in a moment. Uh, Dave doesn't visit us very often and he's about to have to drop off. And we've only made it through two people in the queue. So I would love to see what's on Dave's mind for a moment. <laughs> Hey, Jerry, thanks. Oh, nice this, I mean, it's, I've gotten to contribute already, and this has been a really fun. Uh, let's see what's on my mind. I mean, from this conversation, there's been a whole series of things around kind of economics that I've been pondering. And I feel like I've, like I like in my learning over the last you know, couple of years, it's been like this realization that economics as you know, physical law isn't accurate, but economics as modular modules of algorithms and stuff that are helpful to understand what's going on is useful. And that the market is and, and, tr and trade, right, are very central to our kind of current modern versions of these modules of economics. So we we keep creating markets as a as a design choice. But I think Jerry, that you know, the inverse of designing for trust is that with a market, you have to design for scarcity. Markets only work when you have scarcity. I'm unclear about that. Yeah, try it. Try a market. No, I mean, uh, so open source software is it scarce? Yeah. Not in a market. What do you mean? It's not in a market. Of course, it's in a market. You can go buy. There's markets the, above it. There's no, markets you can, above you can it. Go it's buy, a free competitive you can, space. You can go pay for people to use open source software to make that's stuff. It, but that's because their time is scarce. Their time literally is scarce. There really but is. There's a market scarce. around open source software, is there not? The software itself is not in a market. The <laughs> software itself is pretty. It competitive. sure seems to be in the market. It it supports markets. Right. The, the open source software itself is abundant. <laughs> I'm just saying it's more complicated than scarcity equals markets. I, 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 I balk when I hear that. Well, anyway, so the test I think that you could be is if you are if your answer is design a market, check yourself to see if you're creating an artificial scarcity. Totally agree with that. And, and, and I went to work where they teach you that uh, scarcity equals value, which is a hidden, a hidden language, a hidden way of saying, and where there isn't scarcity, you should go create some artificial scarcity because only then is there a marketplace and only then can you make exorbitant profits and the best kind of profits are monopoly rents. So why don't you go ahead and try to do that? Yeah, and, no, and that's, I mean, it's just taken me six years to figure that out. You figured it out a long time ago. But to, to me, that was a realization that oh, well, I use markets as a tool, kind of intellectual tool, but they have a hole and be careful when you use them. That's, so that was the, um, I, well, totally shifting gears. The other thing that I've been thinking about, and Jay, cool. this is you know, back to your stuff, is I've been, I'm hanging out in Boston. So I've been talking a lot with Sue um, about Berkman. And, um, and one of the things I've been trying to, I've been thinking, and, and I've been working with this Global Regeneration Collab, which is supposed to be peer-to-peer -peer support for change makers. And the question is kind of, what does it mean to support change makers, right? And in Berkman, I think they have a similar context. So it's like, how do they support their fellows and what kinds of services do you offer and how you create community? And I feel like we've, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, kind of let slide a whole bunch of critical technologies around collaboration, around trust building, around information sharing. And you're still holding the flag kind of, but you know, you're, you're, but like, you know, like I keep wanting to point at Jerry's retreats as the, you know, as a model that we ought to be using or, or I loved your email today where you were doing the, um, you're going to do shared, re, you know, shared watching of the, of the hearings and stuff like that. I mean, Berkman should be doing stuff like that. Right. I mean, they should just make it as part of their kind of free, easy community stuff. Anyway, I would yeah. love to have more kind of options and things. And, and they're in a very interesting position because they're, you know, a target. 
So how do you do it in a situation where you're still keeping people safe and, you know. And if you're too large, you become a target. And if you're too large, you sometimes ossify. And these are design questions that are high in my mind right now. It's like, what, what do you, what, how do you design a lightweight organization that has a lot of impact, but doesn't do, doesn't have those problems? And it's so interesting that like, and in their case, it's like, they really don't, you don't have to, they don't have to worry about competition, right? I mean, they're fucking Harvard. They've already got all the smart people. They already know all the rich people. You know, it, it, that isn't the point anymore. So it should be an abundance creating engine. But like, what's our advice for how people how to create abundance? And I would, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said, I don't know, create a wiki. But like, we've, we've been doing this stuff around wikis don't seem to work. So you I, know, believe what is that, it? Uh, I believe what the Harvard, Harvard abundance creation engine is aimed only at the endowment. But that's just me. Well, but but as a center, right? I mean, don't look at, you know, take take tear apart the organization and look at the thread. Right. So there are chunks of Harvard that are not doing that. Right. And totally agree. Don't have to, could, could choose to not do that, I suppose. Well, yeah. And, and ironically, MIT is one of the birthplaces of open, uh, of open, open content and open courseware and all those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm reminded of a study that they did with the faculty when they were trying to redesign MIT in the early days of the inner tubes. And they were about to go do an online uh, school with, you know, fees and all the things you would assume. And then they went back and looked at the raw data of the interviews. And to a person, the faculty had said, no, our mission is to educate the world and to create open stuff. So, so out of that was born open courseware, uh, which is awesome and genius. Which they made a good profit out of, so when they sold it. And, so. and, and by the way, so one of my big questions is, how do you make a profit while feeding the commons? If, yeah. if we're not going to throw capitalism overboard, then we have to heal it. And part of healing it is harnessing it to create abundance and commons instead of uh, depletion and uh, you know sequestration and waste um, and I'm profit not is yet waste. pardon profit is waste is it if I have extra on my body we call it fat or cancer profit is waste um, what if that profit is just uh, money floating around in the system that you can then repurpose to something which would create more value in the system what, acorns, if that, what if that's a way of seeing uh, profit? Acorns aren't waste. Right. Acorns aren't waste. Most of them never give rise to another oak tree. Some of them feed pigs. Some um, of them feed worms. Right. Right. But, but that's the point. Like, why is that system producing profit? But a part of it is that money is just a proxy for something. It isn't a thing. Right. Right. But but we live in we live way deep lay, layers nested deep into a series of mental assumptions that we've been that, that were sort of brought in at the top of this call by Doug's questions um, about the role of money profit all those kinds of things and so Grace can you see uh, is there a capitalist world without profits probably not does that does, does that pencil out somehow is there is there a form of capitalism that doesn't believe in profits. Capitalism is a very weird and new system. Yes. I'm just, so, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking the question what, about post-capitalism like, versus fixing it. I, I, I don't, I, you know, we've only had it for a couple hundred years. It's just this, we're, we're evolving out of it. Why would we save it? What's so great about it? Um, I think only because it's very hard in the middle of it to see it vanishing and being replaced by some some other thing. It's really like most people can't imagine. We, we are, are such forgetful and so, so ignorant of history that what Condi, the Condi Arant critique of Europe is totally alien to us. And we're like, no, there's no other ways to make like things work, right? You must, just... have, you must yeah, have markets, but, but et cetera, et cetera. failure of the imagination isn't an excuse for not doing something. I mean, come on. Totally agree. Totally agree. <laughs> come on. If I may, most if people I may can't imagine you... it. Uh... If I may give you one example, please, uh, Grace, if I may give you one example, water rights throughout the United States have been allocated about 100 years ago, okay? So you have farmers today who are sitting on water rights that they're using to flood their fields to go alpha alpha to ship to China yeah, and Saudi Arabia. So now you're going to tell these guys to walk away from their water rights, you know? And, uh, and see what happens. Conversely, what they're doing in California, they're paying farmers to surrender their water rights, to share their water rights, but they're paying them to make, to make good for the loss. And, uh, and, and life goes on. So to, to, 
to make radical changes in this in this environment and frame uh, and uh, saying profit needs to go away that is utopia it's not going to happen in time to make any change at all you know for us to to move forward here well, i think that's again lack of imagination right i think to, it's not that capitalism is going to end tomorrow but if you don't know where you where you're going you don't know whether you've taken a step in the right direction or whether you're just going around in circles totally so at agree. least having some imagination about what that looks like helps you make a step in the right direction. So how do we stimulate that imagination? Because that's that's part of my puzzle too. It's like nobody can imagine alternate forms of staying alive and being happy on the planet. And and so every now and then I'm you not hear nobody, stories. excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, excuse I, me. I'm, I'm not room. nobody like either. Work, man. This, this room is statistically at the wee little tail end of the distribution. Um, but statistically at the wee tail end of distribution is where change comes from, you know, never, That's true. you know, never doubt that a group of well, meaning you know, like, it doesn't have to be everybody. It's, you know, it's one at a time. But change, and somebody has, somebody has to take, take, step outside of get out of the matrix of all of these yeah, that's I've the way that. It, look where that got us but that's if 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 we're trapped and that's what it is and that's the only way and these are the only choices and all of that stuff and my experience is really getting outside of all of that and and that's not easy on an individual basis like to try to actually fight out from under all of that and get to a true blank sheet of paper starting clean. Like that's a really powerful start. And if somebody gives utterance to something that's birthed from that place that just the existing frame wouldn't even allow to be thought or entertained or, or played with, even on a conceptual basis, then you know we're playing the past forward and then nothing's going to change we're going to go extinct well there's that um stacy then class yeah well as far as stimulating imagination i remember a story where a high school teacher had his class go back to the situation of the titanic and they were able to figure out how they could have saved all of these lives and sometimes i think if we were to go back and look at certain ideas that went bad but started out right and if we could go back and say well what would have happened if we did this and play it out what would have happened if we did that and play it out um and then to doug's point of starting with a blank slate i think i said this to you class the other day is what i was talking about is that i've never seen anybody sit with a blank you know like starting with a blank slate and draw out a design of how everyone, how everything would work out with no losers. You know, like we're always looking to take power away from the existing power structures, but with no way of fitting them into the program. So that's all I wanted to share. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Um, Mr. Mugger. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that we are living inside a complex adaptive system, and right? you can't just stop it and then say, okay, let's start over or let's do something dramatically different. And, and this, this last week has been, uh, I mean, really hard for, for me and, and for others. Here is a, I shared, I shared this uh, book on the thread. I don't know if you saw it, but there are some, I mean, this video here, there's some wonderful conversations in there um, where people are basically saying that I'm grieving because I know that this is not that we are, we are moving into times that are very unpredictable and traumatic, right? And then I just happened to do uh, a talk for Gene's group from the Systems Thinking Network. Um, and I, uh, let me see if I can pull that one up. But the, the, uh, I, I developed this thing really for Gene, but then I ended up using it uh, in a bunch of other places. And that was really, um, 
that that was really uh, to explain why we should be using you know community food systems and so on and so on. But in the process of explaining, I'm used some old files from 2018 when I developed a training class for citizen climate lobby business climate leaders. And I looked at slides that I had set up in 2018, and, uh, and, and you see they are still relevant today and nothing happened, right? We're, we're talking about, uh, let's eliminate profit. Or, I mean, we're talking about exotic stuff, right? When, when, when literally we are right in front of this uh, iceberg that we're raising towards, yeah? And there is just no si simple, easy way around this thing. Um, now, so so we 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 have, and I mean, when you and I explain this in the video, when you just look at our carbon budget in 2018, you know, we had 196 or so gigatons of carbon left in the carbon budget, which is a composite of all the climate models out there. In the same year, we used 37 gigatons and pushed them into the atmosphere. Right. So today's 2022, nothing has happened except the but. The, the, the consumption has still increased. So we have basically used up the carbon budget. No one's talking about it. And the idea of the carbon budget was for scientists to say, we think we can load this much carbon in the atmosphere before this thing may spin out of control and we don't know what it is going to do. So that's where we are today. So this video here, when you listen in to just the, even the first two or three conversations, because coming to terms, right, that we are heading into a future uh, within the next few months, you know, because the, the global food supply is down by 25%. Global food supply is down by 25%, right? So the Europeans are freaking out because they're looking at mass migrations, you know, out of Sudan, Yemen, Lebanon, you know, countries that can't afford to feed their population anymore. Um, even Israel is down... 46% of grains imported into Israel come from the Ukraine, right? So even Israel has an issue here uh, trying to, to, to sort itself out. So, so it, you have the urgency of this moment, but it's not reflected in our conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lars. Um, kind of going back to address what Stacy said, I just want to really quickly um, screen share my presentation in Kaunas, just a couple bits of it. Uh, so this is what I, here's the deck. I just put a link to this deck uh, in our chat, but I basically said, here's here, here are my assertions. The social contract is being involuntary and renegotiated. Human history is a struggle over the joystick in the cockpit. Alas, emotion and membership trump reason most of the time. Facts don't change people's minds. Narratives are the primary weapons in this battle, and we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads. By the way, this is my amateur theory of history. We always have been. That is what human history is about. So what's a better narrative? Then I'm like, I can't really answer this without going a little deeper because we are now drowning in the information torrent. Spoke a little bit about stocks and flows. The platform and publishing models love flows and addiction, and they hate stocks and will do anything to sort of break stocks. This makes us amnesic and amnesia makes us easy to spin. And then I talked a little bit about my use of the brain. And then I said, remember emotion and membership from reason most of the time. So my answer is trust and sense making, which I talked about at the end of the presentation. But then I said, uh, let me go, hot questions, recent complications, assertions, narratives. So I then basically had a list of narratives that you would all recognize uh, across human history. And I said, uh, <clears throat> so here's a bunch of narratives. Uh, well, the white man's burden, the communist manifesto, Mao's cultural revolution, the new deal, the iron curtain, the domino theory, laissez-faire economics, the Washington consensus, the Quran, the Bible, uh, Reaganomics. And then, uh, and Stacy, this is more toward what you said. These are narratives that lost that I wish had won. So the great law of peace from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, there's traces of it in the American constitution, but boy, they had a good thing going. They'd sort of figured out a lot of things about how to run society. <coughs> anarchism got written into, into, into history as like chaos, terror, but anarchists, as far as I can tell, in the many different flavor, the Baskin Robbins flavors of anarchism, they're busy trying to figure out how humans can collaborate with each other to create a society that works. Um, and they're so dangerous because they say we don't actually need a large socialist machine or a big capitalist thing because those will eat us. 
Uh, looky here, there's a different way to do it. Uh, Georgism is a land value tax. Owen, uh, Robert Owen is the founder of socialism, but Owenism is more interesting. And then you may have some that you wish had won. Uh, and I'm really interested in what this list, list looks like for other people. Uh, but I just wanted to put that up uh, because because there's a whole bunch of highly functional narratives that didn't make it that that you know uh, got very very efficiently marginalized or even uh, demonized in the U.S. We managed to demonize not just communism but also socialism. Never mind anarchism. All those things are terrible, terrible things. And yet, when you look at the stats of who's happiest in the world, it's the social democracies of Northern Europe. Thank you so much. Uh, which are you know nice functional versions of what socialism ish looks like. Except Jerry, they, they benefit from neo-colonialism. Uh, I'm, I'm a Nordic. I love what they do there, but they have this huge advantage. Either they've they're Norway and they have a lot of oil, or they've been investing around the world and doing a great job of sucking the profits back home. Um, and that's a lovely conversation to have elsewhere. But like Denmark, is Denmark guilty of those things? I mean, I'm, I'm like Denmark have, didn't really have colonies. They didn't. They were. I said neo neo economic colonialism. Yeah. The, the, the banks and the particularly the banks um, have just done a great job of of investing wisely and and in many cases developing countries are on the other side of the of the equation. Uh, Grace. So first of all, I want to welcome Naomi, who I invited. Yes, to thank you. For the first hour, she has another obligation. Oh, hi. Yeah, thank you, Grace. Uh, I'm just, uh, so I'm, I'm a developer, a software developer for iPhone apps and have a, an agricultural background. I studied at UBC Agroecology. Uh, was going to get into a niche of like animal feed, sustainable animal feed, especially for fish, um, which was like going to be insect protein. But <laughs> after starting a master's program in the Netherlands, I was going to Wageningen. Uh, I decided I was kind of against this kind of uh, centralized um, mass production uh, for, yeah, I want to help the farmers. So yeah, I've, I've joined here. Grace invited me to join you. Uh, I think you're not in the tech field, which is more also really interesting to, to see what people are actually doing, like with people, uh, who are not in tech. Um, yeah, just here to learn from you all. Thank you for letting me be here. Um, Naomi, thanks for joining us, and Grace, thanks for, um, welcoming Naomi into the room. I was, I was going to do something, but I hadn't quite figured that out. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't either. I just I just said welcome. It wasn't that hard. It really wasn't that hard, was it? It wasn't really a big challenge. So I guess what I want to say is there's um I'm feeling like this kind of I'm feeling this push right now in the industry to do more and also in this call, call to do more. And when I look around, there's a real, uh, I think there's actually a gap in the way that people speak about the problem, depending on where they are in the continuum of imagining what to do next. And so like Gil, myself and Klaus, we're very, and Doug also, we kind of at least have our toes into, and sometimes a lot more than our toes into, what are we up to next? And there's a certain tone to that discussion that is very different. And it feels like there's almost like, and it's not just in this conversation, not just in this call, but I'm seeing it in other calls as well. And I, of people kind of going, Oy, uh, boy, we're in this big problem. We have to explain the big problem. And like, no offense, Jerry, like that whole list of things we did and didn't do and the regrets from the past is in that category. And the, but it's really difficult to change things. And, but how are we gonna imagine that? And I feel like, you know, like what do we do even within this group to take people who have done a good job of figuring out where the problem is and get their toes over that line to 
hey, how about you join somebody else's project? Or what is the action you're going to take instead of just oi vavoying? Because I, I think that even in this call, we're kind of starting to transition into that new world, and that oi vavoiness is pulling back the people who have already got their toes over the line. Um, huh. I'm not sensing that same energy that you just described, but others might be. Um, jump in if you are. I, I feel like those of us who are leaning in heavily and have large projects are like storming, storming the walls kind of thing. Uh, and I agree with you entirely that it would be nice if more of us sorted ourselves into your into the different projects and said, oh, this this resonates with my life energy and calling and let's go. Uh, totally agree with that. But I'm not sure I'm, I'm feeling a retraction or a pullback or an oiva voiness, which is a new word for me. Um, Klaus. Yeah, the, the uh, how, how do I frame this? When, when, when people think alike or understand a situation alike, then they react accordingly within the context of their resources, ability, you know, environment. And uh, I mean, in the conversation we had in Gene's workshop, there was a there was an author of, of uh, you know, some personality testing and in, 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 uh, management consulting. And we talked about the difficulty to penetrate um, people's awareness and, and find acceptance to very uncomfortable issues like you know, climate crisis and environmental de decay and all of those things. And it's extremely difficult to do, but see, to me, um, when you look at conversations, and I'm in a, in a lot of workshops, uh, you know, uh, listening, listening in and, and being active, we, we don't seem to have reached a level of understanding of how much trouble we're actually in. Yeah? So, so this this uh, video that I posted you know, about this uh, uh, living in a in a dying world, um, there are some really deep reflections of this is really bad. I mean, we are in some really bad times, and we are moving into something where we need cohesion within society. And what we do instead is we're fighting with one another, right? I mean, it's all over the place, domestically, internationally, and so on. And it's a reflection of the crisis, but it's the, the crisis is overwhelming us you now in the way that we're acting and reacting. And even when you think about our conversation today, right, is there really a reflection of when deep caca, right? I mean, this is really bad. And, and so what can I do individually within my circumstances, my sphere of influence to change that? And that whole discussion about uh, uh, altruism, reciprocal altruism, or whichever way, you know, we want to frame it. I posted a, a webinar that's coming that's coming online here. It says mutual aid in the great unraveling, right? So when you when you dial in uh, to to um, to to where we really are, you find a lot of people thinking deeply about, you know, how do we protect ourselves? How do we uh, 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 secure our 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 neighborhood you know, for once? Working hyper local, and so that's. Uh, I, I find a uh, response here in Oregon right now. I got invited to workshops with Oregon State University and Oregon State Extensions, and they created this big group uh, of, of uh, uh, members from USDA and FSA and so on, and farmers you know, debating what are we going to do? Right? Because we're running out of water, we can't grow food the way we used to. Where are we going with this? And, and so these, these discussions are not as deep as I think they need to be at this point, you know, to really, to really embrace this enormously dangerous time we're experiencing. Do, do, do people just need to be across a certain threshold where they're like, oh, crap, I better do something. Things are grim. Or do they need to achieve some kind of full light bulb goes on moment? Like, is there... Uh... I, I worry that agreement on the nature and scope and depth of the problem is, is itself a, a wicked problem and might be impossible. And I'm wondering, how do we just get enough people motivated to tip into, this is not business as usual, I've got to do something really big. 
and, and it's not necessarily big, you know, the, uh, what, what I was saying is we all have our own individual context. Some of us have a little bit more reach than others, but everyone, uh, uh, you know, can be conscious you know, in, in how my individual behavior impacts the commons. And, and there are things anybody really can do once you understand that. You know? Um, Gil and then Naomi, I'd love to hear more about your fight to find funders. And sorry, Grace, you can jump in too. I just want to say that I think it's unfair to and inappropriate to think that we got to get more people to this conversation. Most people are not in an emotional place in life where they can handle the conversation. Oh my God, we're all going to die. And we are all going to die. And that was always true. It's been true since the moment we are born. But most people cannot emotionally handle the level of conversation about how bad the situation is. And I think it's not our job to bring them into that. When people are ready, they'll be there. And I love what Klaus is doing on this local level. Look, I'm not going to have to show you the whole picture, but how about you just grow a few peppers? Uh, Gil? Yeah, um, um, Grace said some of what I was going to say. I don't think our job, Jerry, is to try to bring more people into this awareness of the seriousness of things. I think that's going to quite take care of itself. Uh, not fast enough, but that will happen. And I think more, uh, more of our job is to ready where do they turn when they realize that? Where do the, you know, the, the VCs, the policymakers, the owners, the politicians, et cetera, and, and, and our neighbors, where do folks turn when they realize they need to turn in some other direction than where they're headed? Um, I'm, I'm not into convincing anybody of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like the reframing of, we don't need to move people past some mark. We just need to get people engaged in doing something that's useful. Um, Naomi, um, in your self description, you talked about trying to help farmers, small farmers, uh, and I think that is a noble and quixotic endeavor uh, because the system is so rigged against small farmers. Uh, I've got a bunch of thoughts in my brain about that. Uh, I feel so much sympathy for small farmers, and I'm wondering if you just want to share a little bit more about how hard it is to find funding or any other aspect of that of that quest, because because you're you're totally on the right thing, and it, it's painful to hear that it's so hard. Yeah, definitely. So uh, my journey has been, so I'll start at, I'm 29, right? And I've been having this dream to actually start my own farming project for about six years. Uh, and uh, I continued to, you know, try to go into the places where I could uh, make the connections uh, to make this kind of dream happen. Um, and five years in working in corporate projects, mostly like huge corporate projects, taking high salaries as a software engineer so I could save my own capital. When <laughs> five years into that, I realized, okay, I, this is gonna take me like 15 years. So I need to find another way. Um, yeah, five years into that, uh, I decided to go to Wageningen so I could get respect from the like environmental scientific community. Um, and then talking to a lot, I spent a year there almost, uh, and talking to students there that also is like 30,000 students all studying environmental subjects, uh, pretty much. And like all of them are saying they just want to live on a farm, but Unilever is the biggest sponsor at Wafninga and pretty much they all end up going to huge biotech companies and working or working for PN, PNG and Seriously. Other, yeah. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse there. Um, and like now also talking to you, I'm more in the Dutch uh, life here and talking even to uh, uh, conservation enthusiasts in, in, that are Dutch. Like when they when I speak about Wageningen to them, they also have the same opinion. I mean, just last week I went to an event about uh, a bunch of uh, doctorate students that were uh, given uh, land, like empty lots in Amsterdam and other neighboring areas but by the Dutch government to do like community rewilding projects where they would involve the community and they increased biodiversity by like 40% in 10 months, one of them. Uh, but still convincing the government that it's worth 
a permanent uh, rewilding is like impossible. Uh, they, they, the response one of them got was like, oh, this is a parking lot for a festival that happens two weeks per year. So uh, sorry, we'll give you another place. And it's like, but we want to create a relationship to the land and we want to involve a community. Like it needs to be a permanent thing, but they're all struggling to just, I mean, the Netherlands has a, has a shortage of land. We all know that, but mm. um, it's just like crazy to hear that everybody is struggling to really communicate how important it is to the people who are the ones giving us the funding for all these projects, right? So yeah, I, I've been struggling with that in the tech industry as well. Like there's the whole re uh, refi, rege regen movement happening, um, but still, you know, like, uh, talking to VCs, they, they say there's like 30 trillion in impact funding available for impact projects and it's like pretty much philanthropic funding. But when I talk to VCs, they're like, well, what is, they don't use KPI, but they want some other like metric for return of investment. I'm like, I thought it's philanthropic, though, you know? And then they also say that you need to have a pilot project first because I want to go to Kenya. I'm trying to move to Kenya soon. Um, and uh, I have a community there from helping organize a, a DeFi conference. Uh, and there's just a lot of opportunity for like decent digitizing decentralized structures for farmers, which would really help them. Um, but even there, it's like, you know, talking to VCs in Europe, they don't want to give me money to do a farm in Kenya. Like, why don't you do it in Europe? <laughs> it's like, I don't know how to get through, you know, it's, uh, and talking to yeah. everyone else, it's the same struggle. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, two things. One, I think that the amounts of money you're talking about that this sector could use are not gi giant amounts of money. It's certainly not in comparison with what a biotech startup would eat or anybody else. This is not, the, this is not huge pools of investment needed. Um, and second, have you smelled or seen anywhere in the corners alternate sources of funding that look interesting or useful or good, whether it's individual philanthropists who give a damn or uh, alternate swords, uh, forms of crowdfunding or whatnot? Like, like where else, how else can this sector be, be stood up? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think also Grace uh, and I are both experimenting and exploring a lot different avenues. I mean, I've applied for grants from different foundations that are Web3 protocol foundations. Um, yeah, it's just, I think it's the language. I don't know, communicating the language to the business people because they don't. Hey. The conservationists are also saying, hey, <laughs> people that are even from the community. Like if they say in biodiversity was increased, it means nothing to them. Uh, and yeah, you have to just, they said the more effective way to communicate it was using very, very simple language. Like it's healthy and it's uh, good for the community. Like, no. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but, no, have, you, have you checked in with your local soil and water conservation district? No, uh, because I don't plan to stay in the Netherlands. So I'm not uh, trying to, really, I guess, dig deep here. I'm, I've been going to conferences all over Europe. Uh, and I went but to- But if you're trying to start a farm, but right? if you're trying to get money for a farm, your local soil and water conservation district is the go-to place to connect you with funding sources. And USDA has a number of funding available for startup farmers. That's actually a big topic right now for USDA getting into. So that would be your first place to check in with. Oh, the USD, the 300 million uh, package? No, forget the $300 million package. I just put $20 billion into the Title II conservation programs of okay. the Farm Bill. And part of that, uh, the Title II is helping startup farmers with seed money, you know, with uh, know how, how to sign a lease and things like that. You might okay. want to connect, connect uh, with can Klaus. You, yeah. Can you send me the link to that, please? Yeah. Yeah, because I, I I I want to involve young people, right? I mean, this is the biggest argument I have. Is I I'm, I want to. There's so many young people in Kenya, especially too, right? That uh, we have the 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 physical capacity to do this kind of work. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so some some piece of this is storytelling, like better storytelling, to wake people up and get people to see what's going on here, but but it's complicated. Yeah, that's an um, art in itself. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, we've got our 90 minutes. Um, let's take a couple more um, points of view and uh, and maybe wrap this call. Doug, uh, Doug B. Um, so at, at the center of all of this is this phenomenon of how to reawaken people like period and reawakening people does not necessarily require reawakening them to how bad it is actually reawakening people is by and possibilities, approaches, narratives, you know, it's, it's a function of who, where, in what context. And, you know, it's sort of the difference between loving somebody and loving somebody unconditionally. And you can love somebody the way you want to, or you can love somebody unconditionally, which is figuring out the way in which they want to be loved. And those are two radically different things. And it does not require, in my mind, it doesn't require somebody be awakened to have to understand or acknowledge or recognize or be terrified by all of the things we are <laughs> in order for them to be awakened into action, into being energized into being shifted, how can I serve or how can I help? And that happens all the time, natural disasters, like there are all sorts of things that push that button. And so I, this is, I'll make this as quick as possible. So my wife got a bookkeeping job working for a winery. And the owner is third generation, way over his head. Business is underwater, but has a huge asset base. Brings in a young guy who's done it before, got screwed, and is ready to do it all over again. And I'm talking to the young guy about like, you could do this and this and this, and he's got it. And I said, and the owner doesn't have to understand any of it. You don't have to relate to him as the one who has to make decisions or even be involved. You just need to be transparent about what you're doing and make him feel safe and taken care of. And then go ahead and do what you need to do. And I think that, that focusing on the human being dimension of people and what activates them and what increases their fear and their isolation and their safety and protection devices and all of that stuff. Like those dynamics have a seat at this table and they're sort of forgotten and left out or ignored completely. And um, I'm there, I'm like, that's where I'm living like trying to crack those nuts, get insights and figure things out and break up the preconceived, imprinted, logical, learned requirements that if they only understood what I understand, they would, like, none of that is true. <laughs> I just, like, it's not, our spe it's not the way our species works. It just isn't. So I'm, I'm done, sorry for the Don't energy, sorry. the energy of that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that seems to be a good rest spot for this conversation, I think. Um, I appreciate all of your heartfelt presences and uh, wish it weren't all little rectangles of Zoom all the time. Uh, was excited to see what happens when humans meet in person when I was at the event in Bucharest, which was pretty amazing. 
um, very, very different to wander around and bump into people and just sort of sit down next to somebody, you know, while trying to figure out how to reach over everybody and grab some food off the communal food table, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Gil, I don't know when the next retreat is. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's in my head, but uh, got to sort out a couple other things first, but thank you. Um, so thank you all, and I will see you all next Thursday. Anybody who wants to join on watching the hearing, I'm, I'm going to be over on the OGM Town Square channel on Mattermost. I may stand this Zoom back up, but I haven't done so yet, haven't committed to doing so yet, but I certainly want to co-watch with other people and see what's up. So That's at 10 o'clock, right? That starts at 10 in a little under a half hour. I know. And it might be the last show. Might be their might be their curtain call. I don't know. I don't know what they have up, but they've committed to end by the end of the year, and I don't understand all the rest of it. So, thanks everybody. Persevere. Thank and Naomi, thanks for joining us. Really nice to have you here. Yeah, uh, I'll continue to come back. Thank you for having me. Love that. Bye. Bye.